historical meeting on Forum Romanum, as in 50 years, we didn't have a morning session. So uh, for the first time, we are going to host such a distinguished scholar and dear colleague with a very great topic. But in the morning schedule, very happy time. And I mentioned in the first uh, talking about uh, uh, the circumstances in Serbia today is All Souls Day. So uh -huh. I think that some people are going to visit the graves of the relatives. And this is also the reason that uh, mm -hmm. we do not have a great presence of the auditorium. Uh, in the same time, I'm sorry that I have to start with a very bad news about our member of Forum Romanum and our dear friend Marco Petrak from the University of Zagreb, who passed away about two months ago in his 50 in his office at the University of Zagreb. He was with us at the last session of Forum Romanum and nobody could expect that he will not be with us today told me that he is eager to listen to be present, but we really have to think on him and to pray for his soul, which is really not easy to say in this moment. But with this small, maybe improper introduction, I would like to greet our dear colleague, friend, and distinguished scholar from the University of Tasmania, our colleague Michael Bennett. And this is really a pleasure to have such a topic. The topic is about vaccination. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't ask Novak Djokovic to join us and to tell us his point of the vaccination. But we should now have opportunity to hear what was the point and what was the relationship of the people in uh, Europe in, let's say, 18th century about the smallpox vaccination. Thank you so much for joining us. Michael, it is great pleasure to have such a great guest and I hope that we are going to have some other opportunities, maybe in vivo, which would be great if you are in Europe to drop to Serbia, to Belgrade sometimes and to join us in Forum Romanum just as it is work 50 years all together 51 now we have in our 51st in the future in belgrade and thank you again for joining thank us thank you very much for the invitation and the warm welcome um i'm uh, very glad that you could oblige me and we could work out a, a mutually acceptable time there's very few windows actually between uh, the European time and, and Australia, and I much appreciate the um, the move to uh, what's Saturday lunchtime for you. Um, and uh, we've heard a lot, of course, about unprecedented events in the last couple of years. It seems to be, uh, I don't know what the Serbian version of unprecedented is, but we've heard that word so many times in the, in the last couple of years. Well, thanks again for the invitation and uh, Nina asked for me to talk about uh, some of my work on uh, early vaccination of smallpox and try to link it to the interests of the uh, of quite a few members of the forum in the law. So I took as the heading uh, Salus Populi and thought I'd talk about voluntarism, uh, as well as compulsion, but I'll be mainly looking, I suppose, at some of the coercive aspects in relation to smallpox prevention in 18th and 19th century uh, Europe. This is just an outline of um, the main points. I'm going to be introducing smallpox. Uh, I think it's particularly important to say some things about smallpox in relation to COVID because uh, there's been a lot of, I, I suppose, comparisons, and yet uh, the comparisons need to be qualified by some very real differences between smallpox and uh, COVID. I mean, beyond the obvious differences, um, I'll be looking at uh, smallpox inoculation, um, a practice whereby people 
were artificially infected with smallpox um, in the hope of a better outcome and uh, look at some of the issues uh, arising from ideas of, of, of how to control uh, disease and uh, the concept of uh, solus populi. Uh, as uh, most of you would know, um, the, the expression, the safety of the people, or the health of the people rather, is the, uh, is the extreme law. Uh, and this goes right back to Cicero 2000 years ago and it underpins, I suppose, quite a lot of jurisprudential thinking around, uh, obviously, issues to do, with, uh, to do with health. And one of the points, of course, is that it assumes uh, or uh, assumes that there can be actions uh, really required by uh, special necessity um, to override other laws and regulations in the in the interests of safety. I'll be looking at the cowpox discovery and more specifically about vaccination. One of the points that I'd make at the outset, of course, is to distinguish between vaccination and smallpox inoculation. Um, I'll be trying to use this uh, uh, term inoculation for what has come to be known as variolation, that is actually giving someone, injecting smallpox, as opposed to vaccination, which is uh, injecting cowpox or other uh, vaccines. This uh, part of the lecture will be drawing a lot on my book and I'll be tempted to talk quite a lot about some of the themes that interested me when looking at the vaccination, the, the first vaccination revolution, particularly its rapid spread around the world in the first years of the 19th century. But in section four, I'll be talking about smallpox and the state in the 19th century, some of the issues to do with uh, state uh, uh, organization of vaccination, and of course, the issue of uh, compulsory vaccination, uh, pointing out, of course, that there is a, a great deal of range of activities between what you might call voluntarism and uh, uh, obligation and compulsion. We can see, of course, that it takes many forms and we see this in relation to the, the vaccine mandates, where, of course, people's rights are limited uh, in relation to uh, health edicts and so on and so forth. And this falls short, of course, of pinning someone down and uh, forcibly injecting them with vaccine. Uh, but nonetheless, of course, it is a form of coercion and abrogation of people's ordinary rights. And then finally, just to say some words about the uh, the move to eradication in the 20th century. I couldn't start without um, mentioning an important anniversary and it's interesting that the, uh, the Forum Romanum is, is having its anniversary this year uh, because it's also the 50th anniversary of the last smallpox epidemic in Europe that took place in uh, exactly at uh, this time of the year in, in February and lasting through to April 1972, beginning in Kosovo and uh, spreading into uh, Serbia and Belgrade. I'll be touching a little bit about that at the end. Introducing smallpox first of all, um, and uh, here we've got images of uh, the, small, the, small, the smallpox virus or the variola virus that actually causes uh, smallpox. It's a form of orthopox virus. And uh, of course, also the all too familiar image now of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which uh, is the infective agent of COVID-19. Um, now, this is an important point to remember, of course, that the people that I'm concerned with, certainly up until the uh, 20th century, uh, of course, had no idea about uh, viruses uh, in, uh, as we understand them. In fact, as we'll see, Jenna uses the term virus, uh, and in Latin, of course, it, that means poison. He's looking at something that is is a sort, sort of a sort of poison. Although uh, Jenner, I think, did have a sense of uh, infection and something causing infection. And it's interesting that 
he, uh, he uses the term virus and drops the word poison. He starts off, um, this is around about 1800, he often will talk about the vaccine poison or uh, the cowpox poison, and then increasingly shifts over to virus. And I mean, obviously, to some extent, he's, he's, uh, th this, this is a, a sort of a bit of a euphemism, an attempt to, I suppose, uh, make uh, the process of vaccination seem a bit more natural or, or, or less offensive. But I think he genuinely did have some idea, uh, some insight, if you like, into uh, what we'd see to be now the microbial transmission of disease. Um, it's, of course, a time when uh, still the older ideas of disease causation were dominant, the balance of the humours and so on and so forth. But no one was any, in any real doubt in the 18th century that smallpox uh, was uh, communicated by some sort of infection, that something was happening and uh, causing infection, rather than the traditional ideas of uh, the uh, four humours. And originally people thought that uh, smallpox was sort of innate in some sort of way, that it sort of bubbled out uh, through an imbalance of humours. Um, and they, because they saw epidemics, of course, they did um, see that something else was going on, but um, they could only think metaphorically. And we'll be using the term immunity quite often. And of course, uh, in the 18th century, they had even less idea of what we would see to the immune system. The immune system is still quite a mystery, as uh, we all appreciate now with, with COVID. Um, it's interesting, of course, that, that term is a legal term, and initially it meant, of course, protection from legal interference. Um, and so using the term immunity is uh, and immune is something of, of anachronism in relation to what I'm talking about now. But again, Jenner starts using that term and he uses it a little bit metaphorically. And by the end of his death, in fact, it seems to be used for places that have developed some immunity to smallpox. That is places where smallpox has been briefly at least eradicated and that town has immunity in some sense. So it's sort of part of the way there to more modern conceptions of immunity. Well, there are the two viruses, and one of the interesting points immediately, of course, is that variola virus is a very, very large virus. It's much, much bigger than the coronavirus. And maybe that um, explains why it is more stable genetically. I don't really know, but it is a fact that variola is a very stable virus. and. Uh, we can see, we can examine particles, uh, the DNA of particles going back a couple of thousand years and see that it hasn't changed very much in, the, in those 2,000 years. Uh, I will just mention here that there was another variant of variola, variola minor, um, which is significant because it was much less uh, uh, severe than variola major. It was less common than variola, ma variola major and seems to have only really hit people's consciousness at the beginning of the 20th century. And on the whole, of course, it was a good thing in the sense that uh, where it took over from variola major or where it was the dominant strain, it was uh, a lot less uh, dangerous. And insofar as it uh, gained ground on variola major, of course, that was a very positive development. But if you look at, at some of the other points here, uh, you note know, first of all that uh, variola major has a case fatality rate of around 30% as opposed to uh, COVID-19, which seems to be hovering around 1.4%. Uh, so that's a very significant difference. Smallpox was a much more deadly uh, disease and of course it was also uh, horribly uh, debilitating. Uh, many people uh, of course who survived smallpox um, uh, had those awful uh, pockmarks but also many other complaints that, that lingered with them. Uh, most of the people who were in blind institutions in the 18th and 19th century 
were blind through smallpox. Um, so it was a very, very common side consequence of smallpox to lose sight. And one suspects too that there was sort of long variola of people who um, lost their health more generally. Perhaps one feature of smallpox that isn't always or, or is, is perhaps misunderstood is that it, it wasn't a particularly um, transmissible disease. I mean, it, the, it, had a, it has a high reproductive number. That is the number, of course, they give to the likely average number of other cases for each case. Um, but uh, for the most part, um, the spread was through close family contact. Um, the people who looked at it in the 18th century said that, you know, virtually all the cases they were finding was through close contact. But nonetheless, I think there is that odd feature of smallpox, again, probably relating to its size, is that it did survive in a sort of scab form in blankets and so on and so forth. And when um, smallpox ceased to be um, so common, uh, the number of cases where it appeared randomly, apparently through um, the, the um, through clothes and blankets and so on and so forth, seemed to increase a little bit. People become aware of them because, of course, um, as more people were vaccinated and uh, uh, more protection for individuals, um, smallpox just seemed to pop up occasionally in those other contexts and so it becomes quite notorious. But it's, it's far less infectious um, than uh, chickenpox and way, way more less infectious than measles. What we don't really know is the reproductive number of coronavirus. In some ways, of course, the reproductive number is highly problematic because it's, it's so contextual. Um, and obviously, as more and more people um, are vaccinated and socially distanced and wash their hands and so on and so forth, reproductive number becomes a little bit um, uh, academic. <clears throat> In many ways, the 18th century was uh, an age of smallpox, uh, especially, of course, in, in Europe, though uh, also it seems in, in China and India around this time. It seems that smallpox may have become a lot more severe in the 16th and 17th century. That is, um, there's a bit of a, a, a notion, really, that maybe the smallpox in the Middle Ages, for example, was a, a, a lot more like an ordinary childhood disease, it, it only really seems to have become savage in the late 16th century. And this seems to be probably the speeding up of communications, and particularly, of course, the trans transatlantic uh, cases where, where we see its impact on uh, 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 virgin populations in North America. Um, a lot of people uh, therefore died of uh, smallpox. Um, up there I've, I've talked about 80% of children catching smallpox. So this was a German physician writing in 1798, actually the year that uh, he didn't know at the time, the year that Jenner announced his cowpox discovery, 80% of children caught it. Um, uh, I, I can't see that actually where, <laughs> where, where the um, Oh, perhaps, uh, sorry. It's uh, it's ten percent, I think, of the entire population that died from the disease, and five percent uh, lost their health and beauty through it. So, uh, fifteen percent of people uh, died, and uh, and, and uh, or, or were severely maimed by by smallpox. Um, just. Uh, to bring you closer to Serbia, in, in Vienna, a major epidemic in 1767. Uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, of course, a child prodigy, uh, really had the smallpox very badly and uh, 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 survived, and of course survived to give us such wonderful music. Um, there was a the major epidemic in Vienna, and it was one that hit the Habsburg family very badly. The Empress Maria Theresa uh, was given her last rites, and when she recovered, uh, a medal was struck. People were uh, overjoyed. 
Uh, she'd already lost a daughter-in-law and probably caught it from her. And another daughter died in the outbreak. Another daughter still was so horribly disfigured that she uh, gave up on the marriage that she was, she was going to go to Naples to marry into the royal family there. And instead she took herself to, uh, to, a, to, a, mon to a nunnery to, to hide from the world. Um, and this is a family that had suffered enormously through uh, smallpox through the 18th century, as most royal families, princely families did. And one of the interesting things about smallpox is uh, that it was no respecter of class. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't say that too firmly. There's some peculiarities about it. I think one of the peculiar peculiarities is most of the ordinary working people uh, got smallpox as infants and either died or survived. Um, the problem for the aristocracy and the royalty is that they tried to avoid smallpox, and this meant that they were very vulnerable often in their teens. So we've got these very dramatic cases of um, uh, older children and uh, teenagers and so on in, in princely families uh, dying. This uh, occasion actually prompted, as we'll see, Empress Maria Theresa to introduce inoculation. And this is what we'll be talking about now. Right around the world, it seems, uh, people were aware of some of the weak links in the empire of smallpox. One of the weak links, uh, I'll mention a number of them actually, one of them is that um, smallpox has no reservoir among animals, so that in the end, when it was eradicated among human beings, it, it couldn't come back or shouldn't come back. But the most obvious um, uh, weakness of smallpox made it vulnerable, if you like, to uh, response, human responses, was that it, very, it was evident that people only got smallpox once. And again, here we're looking at a, an important difference uh, with COVID already. The other weakness from the point of view of smallpox attacking human beings is that it signals its attacks. Uh, these aren't sort of particularly stealth attacks because you get infected, you generally have a suspicion you might be infected because you've, you've been, some, been with someone with smallpox and you start feeling a bit ill, but you're not infective until the disease breaks out and until about two weeks later when you start getting a rash and the ra rash rapidly develops in a way that makes it very definitely smallpox. So you're not infective until that stage and uh, most people of course are sensible enough to avoid someone who looks as though they're starting with smallpox. And uh, the infective period comes to an end uh, you know, rather according to a clockwork, uh, uh, 10, 12 days later when the uh, smallpox starts to dry up, that's if the person is, survives and the smallpox begins to dry up and the scabs start to drop off, you can safely go back into the community without being infective. And this means, of course, that uh, a lot of people, um, all the people who don't die of smallpox are smallpox survivors and they know that they can uh, then go out in the world in, with confidence and um, they can also uh, help their relatives through the disease. There's no cure for smallpox but you can certainly make life a little bit more comfortable. And it's this awareness of course that starts giving people around the world the idea that maybe they should not wait for smallpox to come to them, but to bring it on. And uh, we can see um, the point of this when um, smallpox is in the vicinity, when it's uh, almost certain that you're going to come down with smallpox, or you're, you know your, your children are, are, are vulnerable. And one of the things about taking on smallpox, I suppose, is first of all, you can see, well, your child is is healthy at this point in time or it's uh, 
uh, the, the weather's quite nice and so on and so forth, this is the time perhaps where a child has the best chance of going through smallpox. Now we know that um, there were folk traditions of course of, of things like smallpox parties, uh, ceremonies of buying the smallpox where people would visit someone, perhaps a cousin who has had a light experience of smallpox and somehow touch them in a, in a way and, and perhaps uh, smallpox will be communicated in a benign fashion. We also have people who develop some expertise in this and they, it's called sort of uh, the, the, the common form in, in uh, Western Eurasia at least, uh, really from India westwards, seems to involve scratching the skin and inserting some smallpox matter in scr scratching the skin on an outer limb generally. And of course we can see here what's happening is that someone has the opportunity to respond to smallpox in uh, one of the outer limbs rather than uh, taking it in through the respiratory passages and hitting the internal organs too quickly. So in a sense, uh, doing it on the arm has the chance of, we, as we understand it, the immune system having a positive uh, response. A woman in Britain took a particularly interest in smallpox inoculation. She was wife of the ambassador in Istanbul and uh, she heard about the practice uh, that went on in the Ottoman Empire somewhat under the radar I, I think. It was it involved both uh, Turks and uh, more particularly I think uh, the uh, members of the Orthodox community, Greek Orthodox community, uh, some of the people the Armenian Christians and so on and so forth. It doesn't seem to have been acceptable in Islam, uh, so it was something that was disapproved of informally, um, but there was quite a bit of it happening in uh, under the radar, in the back streets and so on and so forth, and particularly in times of a major epidemic. There'd be a lot of activity and the people that uh, are identified as active are actually uh, Greek uh, women and it's uh, it's hearing about this process in uh, Istanbul or hearing directly about the process in Istanbul uh, that led uh, Lady Mary Woodley Montague to have her son inoculated and uh, she wrote home about the practice and uh, when she returned to England she had her daughter inoculated in 1721 uh, with physicians in attendance. Should just mention here that the Royal Society of London was very interested in these practices and had been receiving independent reports for a number of years. So they were very interested in participating in the experiments that followed to establish that it was uh, a useful practice. And by useful practice, of course, what they meant was that uh, generally you caught only a mild dose of smallpox and uh, very rapidly they started to collect data and establish first of all that uh, only one out of ten people died of inoculated smallpox and then they found that really it was more like one in a hundred and then later in the 18th century they're thinking one of several hundred uh, would die of smallpox uh, inoculated um, as opposed to, of course, um, a much larger number dying of smallpox when it was caught uh, casually. The practice uh, soon got some institutional bases in London, particularly in the Foundling Hospital, the, um, that is the orphanage, and also in the smallpox hospital that developed a wing for the inoculation of smallpox. This, uh, of course, practice of inoculation raised all sorts of ethical and uh, to some degree legal issues, though what we find, of course, is with smallpox, uh, the government didn't intervene very much. The, uh, the government was interested in, of course, protecting the kingdom perhaps against bubonic plague, although um, uh, they never stirred themselves too much in England. In France, uh, after the big plague outbreak in Marseille, they, uh, they, they exercised more containment and so on of the plague. But generally, of course, those sorts of things were, were left to the 
local authorities to make sure that people uh, isolated and uh, if necessary, if you like, markets were closed and so on. When it comes to smallpox inoculation, of course, we, we, we see a, sort of a, a much stranger uh, practice in, in that sort of way because um, it's more the ethical issues and indeed whether perhaps smallpox inoculation should be allowed at all. Um, uh, we see, in a sense, a very interesting debate in the Enlightenment because smallpox inoculation, as it was developing, really um, became something of a, of a, of a symbol of uh, Enlightenment thought, if you like, because we're seeing something that is empirical, uh, data-driven, um, rational, according to the lights of the uh, uh, of philosophers like Voltaire, uh, Voltaire uh, was in England uh, in exile and of course got quite interested in what was happening with, uh, uh, with smallpox inoculation and um, he writes about it in his sort of tongue-in-cheek way in the philosophical letters. It is whispered in Christian Europe that the English are mad because they give their children smallpox to prevent their getting it. And maniacs because they communicate to their children a certain and terrible illness with the object, object of preventing an uncertain one. And that, there he goes to the heart of the matter, I suppose. He then says, of course, that the English equally say that uh, um, people on in, you know, the rest of Europe, you know, should get with it and uh, uh, it's rational and uh, people shouldn't be squeamish, if you like, about the prospect of, of giving their children smallpox or arranging for their children to be given smallpox. England, in fact, sort of um, took up smallpox inoculation in a fairly big way in the, 19, in the 1720s. I mean, largely among the aristocracy, who, of course, could be inoculated safely and have the opportunity of good care and the ability to go through the disease in the country house and play in the gardens and so on and so forth. And this is one feature of smallpox inoculation that uh, obviously we need to uh, look at because in some ways it gets support among the elite, um, certainly among the uh, sort of intellectual elite in the 18th century. Um, and uh, we will see too, of course, that it was also available to some of the poorer people in society for rather different sorts of reasons. But if one looks at the history of smallpox inoculation, nothing much is happening really from the 1720s to the 1740s and 50s when a, a smallpox epidemic uh, really creates new interest in the procedure and it's taken up uh, by uh, the philosophers in France and, uh, and elsewhere who champion it and some of the progressive nobles like the Duke of Orléans who has his uh, children inoculated in 1756 and this was covered in the newspapers and generated a great deal of excitement and then in the 1760s we see a succession of uh, royal families, uh, princely families uh, adopting, accepting inoculation. Um, most famously of course Catherine the Great who had herself inoculated in 1768 sent for an English physician to come to uh, St. Petersburg uh, the English physician wisely asked for an escape route if anything went wrong uh, with the inoculation. Catherine the Great was inoculated, her son Paul was inoculated and uh, she also made it available in the imperial orphanages and so on. Her own husband of course had died from smallpox in 1762 and it's in this year too that Maria Theresa, the Empress of Austria, also had her surviving children in Vienna inoculated including uh, young Marie Antoinette, who, uh, when she went to France, um, uh, was part of the story of the introduction of inoculation to the French royal family. Well, let's look at just some aspects of the debate, and one can see here, if you like, some of the issues in relation, again, to ideas of uh, Salus Populi. How far is the interest to do with public health? generally. How far is it to do really with political economy? Uh, those rulers who are interested in inoculation and indeed 
introducing inoculation for their own populations, of course, we're looking at it often from the perspective of great power rivalry and the need of people, healthy people, uh, for the army and for uh, economic development. There's a major in debate over inoculation in France where uh, inoculation was under the ban for quite a while. It was banned in, uh, by the Parliament of Paris, the High Court of, of Paris, until uh, physicians clearly uh, endorsed it. And this was a bit of a problem because the Faculty of Medicine um, was divided and uh, the uh, physicians, like many professional people, don't like to do anything until there is, a, there is some sort of consensus. What is interesting, it's not really opposed by the church. The church, uh, the Catholic church and, the, and most of the mainstream churches put it back to um, uh, the uh, medical expertise. They say, well, if in fact it can be shown to be advisable medically, then the church has uh, no objection to people using it. This is not to say there weren't religious objections, of course, there were individual clergymen and quite a lot of ordinary people who sensed, of course, that, that really smallpox was something that was positively blasphemous. You were tempting providence, taking it upon yourself to determine uh, when you took a disease. And uh, in their view, of course, smallpox was there um, as an instrument of punishment by, by uh, the Almighty and so on and so forth. And one shouldn't be interfering with it. Uh, but over time, really, most of those anxieties were allayed. And uh, as we'll see, too, the, with vaccination, there was broad acceptance of vaccination by the church. Um, indeed, uh, the church positively encouraged vaccination in the 19th century for the most part. Uh, these are the mainstream churches, the uh, Catholic and uh, Anglican and, and uh, Lutheran uh, Calvinist churches where the establishment churches, if you like, uh, what we get, of course, are some of the more extreme Calvinists, some of, the, uh, some of the fringes of the Catholic Church. In the Orthodox uh, tradition, uh, particularly in Russia, the, the old believers um, were doubtful about smallpox so it was, uh, inoculation, so there was, there was some tension there between, as it were, the state church and uh, some of the older traditions. Well, let's just look at the Enlightenment debate. Bernoulli, a pioneer of property, probability theory. I mean, in some ways, what's interesting about smallpox is, is it puts medical statistics out there. He constructed life tables, factored in the risks of natural and inoculated smallpox, and quantified inoculation's potential to add to life expectancy and population. So he's talking now to the Royal Academy of Sciences in Paris. Even if one in nine inoculations prove fatal, he claimed, it remains, quote, geometrically true that the interest of princes is to support inoculation by all possible means, likewise the fathers of children. Uh, D'Alembert, um, uh, another of the notable philosophers, really questioned his understanding of the psychology of risk, particularly, of course, when it comes to parents. And, of course, too, his privileging the interests of the state which would happily sacrifice lives in battle for larger ends. And this was in the midst of the, the Seven Years' War, of course. And uh, uh, certainly, of course, the thinking in armies is that, yes, you can send this sort of company in first and they can be massacred, but by that time we'll bring up our cavalry and so on and so forth. And so it's that sort of thinking that D'Alembert is raising questions about. On a more, more mundane level, we can see a practice that developed in England called general inoculations, where a whole village went through uh, the process of smallpox inoculation together. Because one of the problems is with smallpox inoculation was that even if you make the choice as an individual for, your, for yourself or your family, it's not just you that might be affected by having yourself or someone else inoculated with smallpox. The reality is, of course, that in smallpox inoculation communicates the disease. So if you are inoculating with, for, for smallpox in a place where smallpox isn't an immediate threat, you raise the possibility of communicating the disease to other people. 
So it's a great worry if you suddenly hear that your neighbours next door are bringing someone in to inoculate the children uh, because the children are going to be playing out in the street and communicating the disease to you. So one of the ways to get around this was to uh, have a, a village inoculation. And of course, this was also cheaper because you could hire a surgeon to come for the day. The surgeon could inoculate all the people who, were, who, who hadn't got immunity to smallpox uh, at a sort of flat rate, uh, at, so, sorry, at a bulk rate, and everyone could go through the disease together and you could sort of shut the, 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 the village down for a couple of weeks and then open up and everyone's uh, ready to go. And th these were organised by um, parish councils and sometimes uh, the clergyman uh, the, would, would sort of uh, initiate it. And in this case, David Stewart, uh, who was a vicar of Luton, quite a large uh, village or ta little town really, who started a, a plan, uh, he funded an annual inoculation. And he says, should my plan uh, take place, the expense would not amount to the 50 guineas that are, are paid now for those who have smallpox naturally. What he's talking about, of course, is the parish poor rate, poor relief. That is, a, a, village, uh, a family in the village have smallpox, then money has to be found to support them um, in, the, in, in the parish. And this, is, this can be quite an expense. Uh, he says, but alas, that sum is but a small part of the real charge produced by this dreadful malady that makes a constant augmentation of the parish expenditure. If a labourer dies, his family must be supported. If a mother is lost, the children must be removed to the workhouse where they lose innocence, reputation and that sense of independence, which is the surest principle of industry. So in a modest way, again, he's looking at the political economy, that it's cheaper to... Uh, inoculate the, uh, the population, uh, the, the working population, uh, and uh, in, in a sense there's even a saving because uh, it's more expensive, of course, if people get smallpox and die and the village, like, village, village economy is just disrupted. And then you can see Madame Roland, uh, many of you will know her from the French Revolution, um, and she writes in 1788, and this is the point that Dalabar makes, the psychology of risk. We're trying to decide to have Eudora inoculated. If it was for a stranger, I would be in favour, since it seems, seems that probability lies that way. But I would never forgive myself if my child was to be one of the exceptions. If she were a victim, I would prefer it was the effect of a natural cause uh, than my doing. So, yes, here's the psychology of the issue, that when it comes to the calculus, uh, people wonder, well, I don't like taking that decision on myself. How do I know that my daughter is going to get smallpox anyway? I'm taking it on myself to give the smallpox. And if she were a victim, uh, really, I couldn't live with it. Well, I mentioned that the law was a bit worried about smallpox inoculation because of its danger. And of course, what we get is actions taken by communities against prominent inoculators. Uh, an indictment in 1750 for someone practicing small inoculation failed. There was an injunction against the establishment of smallpox inocul inoculation hospital. Um, there was an indictment of one of the prominent inoculators, Daniel Sutton, um, uh, for bringing smallpox into the neighborhood that was uh, dismissed. Uh, in the USA, uh, well, not the USA now, of course, in the British colony of Virginia, um, though uh, we see that there was success in an act regulating smallpox inoculation, requiring specific authorization by magistrates and subject to stringent conditions. Um, and uh, there was a hope that in some quarters that this could be introduced into England, especially after vaccination became available. Um, but it was not for some time um, when uh, they tried to ban smallpox inoculation once vaccination was established. Uh, the justices wouldn't allow it, the parliament, well, parliament didn't accept it, and the chief justices said, well, there's already uh, um, an avenue available through uh, the common law of public nuisance, 
And so the Royal Genarian Society, a society founded to promote vaccination, found themselves a sort of target in a woman who'd had her daughter, uh, sorry, sorry, I think her son inoculated and uh, brought the child home and uh, of course was often out in the street with that child while the child had smallpox and some of the children caught smallpox and she was indicted for dangerously exposing her inoculated child. And this um, Rex versus Van Tandillo was quite an important act. I mean, it's, it's one of the ones that cited, for example, in those cases more recently where someone's been accused of deliberately communicating um, AIDS and so on. Uh, but again, it was, it was uh, really a, a very sorry affair because Sophia Van, Dillo, Van Tandillo uh, went to prison for three months. She had eight children and had done her best for them as she saw it. Then we have the perspective of William Cowper, a poet you may have heard of. He was certainly someone very active in the anti-slavery campaign. And he reports to a friend, he's writing right to a friend, and he's seen one of these general inoculations in the village of Weston. And he's sensed that the, inocu the general inoculation is focused very much on the parish poor. And we're looking here at a form of compulsion in the sense that most parishes were now threatening their paupers that unless they were inoculated and later on, of course, unless they've been vaccinated, they would not be given poor relief. So again, uh, that's continuing now, I think, with in some places with uh, social benefits and so on. Uh, vaccinations are required for social benefits. So he writes to a friend, smallpox has done, I believe, all it has to do in Western and even women with child have been inoculated. We talk of our freedom and some of us are free enough, but not the poor. Dependent as they, are upon, as they are upon parish bounty, they are sometimes obliged to admit to impositions, which perhaps in France itself would hardly be paralleled. Can man or woman be said to be free who is commanded to take a distemper, sometimes at least mortal? No circumstance whatsoever was permitted to exempt anyone. Were I asked who is the most arbitrary sovereign on earth, I should answer neither the King of France nor the Grand Saint Seigneur, that's the son of Turkey, but an overseer of the poor in England. We should mention here, of course, that um, inoculation, smallpox inoculation, was used on a very significant scale in the slave plantations uh, in, uh, in the Americas, uh, both, uh, well, especially perhaps in the uh, large French uh, uh, plantation economy in Saint-Domingue, which was much the most sizable of uh, those plantations at the time. Well, this is the context then to just look at the uh, at cowpox, and th this is a story that you probably are aware of, Edward Jenner, hearing about a, a, a folk tradition and, and hearing anecdotes of Dairy maids who claim that they are, have immunity to smallpox by virtue of having been accidentally um, uh, infected with cowpox. Uh, so these these are poxes, pustules on the udders of cows, and in the milking process, uh, they're communicated to often the hands of dairy maids or men working in the in the dairies. Uh, all you need, of course, is a little bit of scratch in the skin and uh, the infection comes up and it's a very rare disease and Jenna had to do an awful lot of work to really work out exactly what this uh, what what form of, of pustules actually had this effect and uh, the circumstances in which they had an effect and of course he does an experiment he he is someone who inoculates children uh, with in, in the old sense with smallpox engages in smallpox inoculation what he does, with or without, we don't know the consent of the of the the young boy's father. He gives him cowpox rather than smallpox. Jenny knows, of course, that all these cases of cowpox is seen casual cases. Um, it's not been a deadly disease. Uh, it's not really been a, a severe disease. So he knows he's taking a good a risk, and it's his. Uh, Anecdotal evidence: the cases is he, he collected of uh, people having having cowpox and resisting smallpox over the years, uh, with a, a, a series of experiments that he begins 
that he publishes in uh, 1798, and his treatise uh, arouses a great deal of uh, interest, well, it raises eyebrows, first of all, I suppose, with many people. Other people then uh, see how exciting it is because uh, cowpox is a mild disease, certainly it's not going to kill anyone, and it seems to do the job in, inocul in, in inoculation that uh, smallpox does. So uh, uh, Jenner argues that it gives equal security to a person that actually having smallpox itself would give. And in uh, the third, third sort of, um, uh, well, in a sense, volume, because he, he starts with continuations and so on, in a third continuation, uh, partly uh, pushed by other people who are saying this now, it now becomes too manifest to admit of controversy that the annihilation of the smallpox, the most dreadful scourge of the human species, must be the final result of this practice. And, uh, very optimistic, but um, many people share that enthusiasm. And in, in my book, I, I argue that um, uh, in the first uh, 20 years, they went quite a long way to bringing smallpox under control in parts of, of, of Europe. Here we're looking at, at, at voluntarism in the sense that we're looking at a great deal of excitement and enthusiasm about cowpox. Um, improbable in all sorts of ways, and uh, there were some satirical responses to what people saw as, as cow mania. Um, but people wanted to believe it, and what was more, of course, they could very rapidly replicate Jenner's experiments. All they needed to do was to get some cowpox, and they started inoculating in their little, little, little village or little town, and um, smallpox came along, and the people seem to be uh, immune to smallpox and, and so on and so forth. So uh, lots of people were conducting their own experiments that seemed to seem to work, even though many people were suspicious, as, as uh, that, the, 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 ca the cartoon in the right-hand corner will suggest that people were saying, oh, it's going to, what about in the long term? Is it going to sort of turn our children into beasts? You know, are they going to grow horns and so on and so forth? One of the things, of course, about uh, vaccination was, uh, well, first of all, it did seem just a miraculous discovery. I mean, people, this was still a, a very religious age and uh, people saw it as divine providence that somehow God had pointed us to something available in nature that would protect people from that horrible uh, disease. And we can almost talk about a gospel, a cowpox cow, cow gospel, and uh, some of the clergymen, in fact, wax lyrical about the, the blessings of cowpox and so on. Uh, particularly moving, I found, was a, a little book written about vaccination in the first years by Dr. Robert Thornton, who um, uh, supported the practice. And he begins the book, the first page is a hideous description of what it's like to witness a child with smallpox. And then you turn the page and he says, this was my son, my firstborn child, and I was responsible for the inoculation. And then writes, glorious tidings, happy annunciation. I who have lost by burialist inoculation my firstborn child have a right to exult in the present fortunate discovery of Dr. Jenner. The other aspect is that this is also the age of romanticism. And I think people were very well attuned right across Europe, particularly perhaps in England and Germany, uh, to ideas about nature and uh, natural solutions and the pastoral, uh, the countryside. And uh, you'll see, of course, all these images, positive images, uh, of the cow alongside the, the negative images that we get in that satire. Uh, we also see that other satire, French satire, which suggests, of course, that you know, cowpox could be seen again as, as uh, something that is a new quackery. Uh, the, the charlatans are getting hold of it, and the charlatans did, of course. Uh, many people uh, picked up on it and uh, uh, pretended they could, they could vaccinate. 
Um, what I was interested in, I'm, and I'm, I must sort of rush through a bit of this because but this is one of the things I, I got very uh, involved with, I suppose, were the networks of communication by which it was spread. Most of them were uh, entirely private and philanthropic. They were the networks of people getting in touch with each other, telling them about uh, this new cowpox, helping them uh, get hold of vaccine and, and sharing observations and, and so on and so forth. And uh, a, a major figure in this process was uh, Jean de Caro, who was uh, a Genevan physician based in uh, Vienna. Being a Genevan, he was well networked, not only with Geneva and Switzerland, but the Genevans, of course, had uh, under persecution, they were French Protestants initially, and they were all over Europe, but particularly at the University of Edinburgh, for example, they studied there in the Netherlands, in Scandinavia, and so on. So there was a ready-made network of uh, Genevans who, who spread the news of, uh, of vaccination. And here he is writing in 1801. This is 1798 when Jenner writes his treatise. No one does anything much until 1799 to 1800. De Caro is already on the case. He's already distributing, getting vaccine, conducting experiments in Vienna and spreading it uh, uh, widely. And here he is in a letter telling someone how, you know, what people are doing in Breslau, where they've got uh, their own archive of uh, the eradication of, 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 of smallpox and uh, lots of details being collected there. And uh, that's where to go if you're a historian. Well, um, I can't find any surviving copies of that particular journal. But De Caro certainly seeded vaccination right across Austria and Hungary, through Central Europe, Bohemia in particular, but into Poland, into Italy, Venice, down the Adriatic, Dubrovnik. Uh, he sent a uh, vaccine to Istanbul, uh, where the, uh, in fact, the, the, the ambassador, the British ambassador there, Lord Elgin, um, distributed vaccines in, in Istanbul and into Greece. And uh, uh, this is Lord Elgin of the Marble. So he's, um, he's, he's dismantling the Parthenon at the same time his, his uh, physician is, uh, is introducing a um, uh, vaccine and then sent it on to Baghdad and ultimately to Bombay through the British East India Company networks. And now we've got the statement from the Archbishop of Kolofi that Nina uh, brought to my attention in 1804, uh, telling the, in Serbian the, the people about the blessings of vaccination and declaring that there is no country, even with the most stupid peoples, where the practice is unknown. And certainly what he's doing is there repeating, to some extent, the message of a lot of people at this time, that this is spreading around the world uh, very rapidly. Uh, there's uh, Jean de Caro's own book about the history of vaccination in Turkey, Greece, and the East Indies. Uh, we're seeing it in uh, Russia, um, uh, where we, it is taken up by uh, Tsar Alexander the uh, First. It came to, comes to Moscow, into the founding homes in Moscow and Saint Petersburg, which become the sort of centres for the new practice, and. Uh, it's spread around the provinces. There is an expedition in 1802-3 to which takes it through the European provinces of uh, Russia. And then uh, there's a great embassy that um, Alexander sends to China. And the embassy has a sort of scientific uh, um, brigade as well, uh, uh, doing, making observations in Siberia and within it a, a vaccination facility. And this is where I got uh, very pleased to see this uh, uh, watercolor uh, done by the by the by the surgeon, the chief well, the chief physician, uh, Raymond, a uh, German, um, of vaccination among the Buryats people, the uh, indigenous people around Irkutsk, and this is actually the only sort of representation from life that I've seen of vaccination in these early years, and then a very impressive totals of uh, vaccination in the various provinces in. Um, uh, Russia in the years from 1804 onwards. Again, around the world, we're looking at uh, something that I see as the world arm to arm because vaccine uh, wasn't available 
much at all, not even in England. And uh, an important point that I, I need to stress at this time, and we'll probably repeat it, is that to have vaccine, one needed to vaccinate. So the whole process depended on uh, a continual stream of people being vaccinated because you had some vaccine, you inoculated vaccine into that child. When the pustule developed, you then take from that pustule uh, cowpox vaccine to put into the arms of half a dozen other kids and then perhaps those kids will be taken to another place and they can then uh, provide vaccine for the next town. It was possible to dry vaccine and send it through the post, but that didn't work all that well in many cases. So the surefire way of transmitting vaccine was through this arm to arm uh, process. And the beauty of it, of course, is that you could see that the vaccine had worked on one child before you gave it to the next child and so on and so forth. There are some of the disadvantages with this arm to arm process of transmission, and we'll talk about those a bit, bit later. But this is how it got across eventually uh, the, um, the Atlantic or the South Atlantic to uh, Spanish America with the great expedition um, authorised by the King of Spain that carried vaccination in this fashion across the Atlantic and then uh, the expedition divided one uh, segment going to Mexico and eventually to Apapoco and then to the Philippines and then back to Spain, the other one going down the spine of, the, uh, of South America. Vaccinating as they go, taking one group of children to the next village, using them to then see the practice and then another batch of children and so on. And at the same time we see too that vaccination has come thanks to De Caro through Baghdad to Bombay uh, through India and then it's taken around the Indian Ocean um, and uh, remarkably um, one ship carrying dried vaccine gets to Port Jackson which is Sydney and begins uh, vaccination uh, there. So this is all at the time when we see the Archbishop uh, um, uh, advising the Serbs that uh, vaccination is spreading around the world. Well, this is where we see the imperatives of vaccination. Uh, and this is an important point. There was obviously a lot of enthusiasm behind vaccination and a lot of people telling people that, you know, this works, you, you've got to get vaccinated and so on. But there's also a very real imperative to find children to be vaccinated because that was the only way of actually generating a supply of vaccine. Time and time again, what would happen is the vaccine would get to a place, uh, they would vaccinate a few people that would work, from them they would vaccinate a few more people and that seemed to be working and then they found that there were no takers and uh, by the time they got some people to be vaccinated again, the vaccine had already lost its power. So there's this sort of sense that there needs to be uh, a, a continuous stream of children and at the same time there needs to be some sort of organisation uh, to, to be behind it. So what is in many ways quite often a private individualistic philanthropic enterprise in a sense depends upon uh, system and uh, what we get of course is uh, all the elements of the system being put together. Systems that survive to this day really, the patterns for example of clinics that vaccinate two mornings a week, you know, sort of Tuesday and Friday morning. Well, that's so that you can vaccinate someone on a Tuesday and they'll come back a week on Friday. Uh, you vaccinate someone on Friday and they come back a week on Tuesday to be inspected to see whether they've got a pustule. If they've got a pustule, of course, that will be lanced and used for the next batch of children. So this is the way in which, uh, in a sense, sometimes the process of vaccination had to be slowed down to make sure uh, that there was a continuous stream of uh, vaccination. And of course we get uh, all the hustle to do with getting people to vaccinate. This is uh, a woodcut in, uh, in Russia, uh, again trying to persuade people visually of the, uh, of the value. We're seeing things like medals, we're seeing um, festivals, um, uh, quite often um, villages of course would be vaccinated together, um, that is all the villagers 
uh, would be vaccinated. Generally, springtime was a good time. And what often happened is that little parties were held for the kids who were being vaccinated. And in uh, Bukeburg, uh, one of the early centres of vaccination, uh, that still survives as the Kringle Fest, where uh, sort of pretzels were given to the children and, and so on. And then we get all the administrative stuff in relation to uh, vaccination. You can see a surgeon's register, French surgeon's register there. And also uh, the church is, is, is preaching uh, vaccination. And again, we'll get a, a sermon. Uh, the parish priest will uh, find out really who should be on the list to be vaccinated. When the surgeon comes along, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the priest will officiate. And this is happening quite as much in Catholic Europe and perhaps even more so in some respects than in Protestant Europe. Um, in, uh, in Spain and in Italy, uh, vaccination is again re received with great enthusiasm. The, uh, there are processions, ceremonial processions and uh, to churches and things like that. Um, uh, the part of this, of course, is the fact that by this time, the, these major, major churches are seen to be part of the state in some sort of way, um, and uh, uh, generally they, uh, I, I suppose, perhaps arising from the Enlightenment, many, many clergymen, many uh, Catholic priests and so on, are seeing, seeing their role as being something more than religious. They're, they're having to sort of justify themselves in a secular way as well. Uh, experience with the mandatory, mandatory vaccination, um, we're seeing from fairly early on um, moves to almost enforce vaccination, at least to make it seem as if it's uh, obligatory. And this happens quite early. Um, uh, one is in the little principality of Piambino Luca, um, set up by Napoleon for his sister. She enforces vaccination in 1805. Uh, but in that year too, the practice is made compulsory in Hessen and Bavaria, uh, though it, it, people didn't have to be vaccinated for a couple of years more. And we see too very mounting pressure in Denmark, and more and more vaccine mandates and eventually uh, compulsory uh, vaccination. Uh, I couldn't resist including the pictures of the daughters of um, Maximilian who became king of Bavaria, who was a lector at the beginning of this period, uh, because they were vaccinated. And, and one of the things that we do need to remember is that the, the royal families had a great deal of interest in vaccination, obviously. And um, they, you know, there is a sense in which they saw themselves as fathers of the people, uh, but they also saw themselves as, of course, fathers of their own children, whose uh, lives and indeed whose uh, complexion and beauty they wish to uh, preserve uh, by uh, vaccination. And um, Maximilian had about five daughters, and I'm not sure who these exactly are, because he had two sets of twins, and I'm not sure whether they, I think that they are both both sets there. Um, and certainly the, uh, the ones on the right are his younger daughters. And I, I am very, very tempted to associate this somehow with their vaccination. And particularly if you look at the ornaments on the girls on the right, they've got an ornament where a vaccine scar would have been. And I, 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 I don't know enough about the history of fashion, but it just makes me wonder whether that sort of uh, bracelet and armlet, if you like, uh, would have been um, of interest. Well, I'm sure it would have been an interest to aristocratic royal women who have uh, who've got a sort of a, a vaccination scar. In Russia, Tsar Alexander in 1811 uh, issues a UKZ mandating vaccination, uh, but he, he later retracted it. And um, this seems to be partly through his religious conversion. He became quite religious in the, in, in, uh, a few years later and under the advice of other people, I, I think, he began to see that uh, uh, vaccination should be a matter of uh, conscience. In Russia, of course, the church was involved, the Orthodox Church was involved in, um, in 
promoting vaccination and in it taking part in vaccination. And priests were virtually ordered to set an example. This is this is from a memoir, virtually ordered by imperial edict, to set an example for their parishioners by allowing their own children to be vaccinated, and then reports that his vaccination was public, almost a ceremony, and it took place on a Sunday when village women, men, men gathered together, and he talks about the mothers crying, and uh, he was a brave boy, and so on and so forth. Well, here we have, um, uh, looking at what's happening in the 19th century, and um, it's uh, one of those things where the PowerPoint just does strange things suddenly. And um, I've got what should be larger characters and very small characters. Um, but the, the key here, of course, is how from uh, the early first phase of vaccination, um, we see a, something of the vicissitudes of the practice. It, uh, one of the things that happens, of course, is that once smallpox disappears a bit, People become complacent, don't bother with vaccination anymore. Uh, and then, of course, smallpox comes and uh, this then leads to interest in vaccination. It's sometimes hard to gear up the system again uh, and uh, people, are, people die. Um, and we see, too, some sorts of issues arising, uh, uh, very apparent by the 1820s and 30s, that vaccination really doesn't give you lifelong coverage. Uh, this is something that we've painfully aware of in relation to COVID vaccination. Jenna had thought that, you know, it was like smallpox, that cowpox would give you lifetime protection um, and denied cases really of smallpox after vaccination. Um, but it became more and more apparent that really revaccination was needed. And one additional twist on this, of course, is that once smallpox disappears, then uh, your immunity isn't being topped up, if you like, by casual contact with smallpox people. So in, in some ways, too, you start getting cases uh, where clearly people who've been inoculated with smallpox in the past are getting smallpox again, as well as people who are being vaccinated. A major epidemic in Britain um, sets them on the road to really make sure that the poor are offered free vaccination, get some sort of system whereby vaccination can be generalised, and for the first time a ban on smallpox inoculation. And then we get the legislation of compulsory vaccination, but without any means really of prosecution. It's there that people have to, but no one knows quite what's meant to happen if people refuse, as most people do. And then you get these moves towards an appointment and then eventually a sort of system whereby there are vaccination officers appointed to secure compliance and this leads to prosecutions, fines and even imprisonment for people who uh, refuse to pay the fines. And one of the legal issues there, of course, is whether the fines um, are repeated. That is, if someone is fined for not having their child vaccinated, do they get fined again the following year when they still haven't and so on and so forth. Uh, is it the same offence or not? Um, all these sort of issues and uh, uh, the problems uh, arising from enforcement of that sort of legislation. In Germany, a very mixed picture, a very interesting picture, because of course Bavaria and, uh, and Hessen and many other smaller states had made vaccination compulsory. Prussia, perhaps surprisingly, in relation to, uh, I suppose, some images of the, of the uh, Prussian regime, didn't have compulsory vaccination. There were moves in that direction in the 1820s, and then uh, they, uh, there's a, there's a, a pullback uh, from it. Um, it's probably the case that in most of Prussia, th people thought it was compulsory, um, uh, but in Berlin, certainly, there was a lot of people who uh, defied, you know, didn't get vaccinated, and major problems in Berlin. Hamburg is the great interesting example because it was a liberal free port uh, with little vaccination at all until uh, the epidemic of 1871. And uh, one of the points that was made here was that uh, Hamburg was freeloading to some degree on all the neighbouring states that had uh, very tight vaccination requirements. Uh, so Hamburg was relatively smallpox free. Uh, because 
in, in a sense. Its neighbours were smallpox free, um, uh, but it suffered very badly in the epidemic of, of, of 1371. In the Austrian Empire, we see that tradition of support of vaccination, uh, quite significant in device, in an imaginative, in uh, in, in encouraging vaccination and disinventizing people resisting vaccination. It was particularly strict, for example, in uh, terms of people who lost their children to smallpox. So a, a child who hadn't been vaccinated, who died of smallpox, uh, there were special uh, procedures that, uh, regarding their burial and the names of parents went into newspapers as children killers. Uh, so the very savage sort of um, pressure on people to be uh, be vaccinated and uh, 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 fairly early on the army had been vaccinated and developed traditions if you like of protocols and uh, the 1836 a regulation on the inoculation of cowpox again uh, produced uh, standard procedures and uh, uh, Nina's excellent article on Serbia uh, points to the uh, adaptation of some of those sorts of measures in Serbia and uh, develop interesting developments there. So that's a, a, a very good article for you to uh, read. Smallpox pandemic of 1870-4 was uh, quite critical and, and the first really major epi epidemic. And of course, uh, there were many people who died who had been vaccinated as we'd be uh, as we perhaps we come to expect perhaps with relation to COVID, uh, but nonetheless, uh, the whole situation, um, uh, all, all the data in a sense, is showing the protective value of vaccination. Even if uh, people get smallpox, uh, they don't tend to die of smallpox if they've had prior vaccination. And in particular, it demonstrated the value of revaccination which uh, the Prussian army had begun to uh, adopt and uh, wasn't much adopted uh, elsewhere and certainly not in the French army. So if you look at the figures there of smallpox deaths, um, more deaths, uh, sorry, uh, civilian deaths in France, well, the epidemic began in France, so there was significant uh, uh, deaths there already uh, but in the army of course we see very heavy mortality from smallpox and in fact uh, prisoners, French prisoners of war in Germany seem to have been a, a major agent in the spread of the disease in Germany particularly in Berlin. If you look at the figures for Germany what you see of course is that hardly any soldiers and of course these are people, German soldiers and of course, these are people who have been revaccinated are, are and die in the epidemic, but you have massive mortality among the civilians. And of course, one of the major centers of mortality is Hamburg, uh, but also in Berlin, where a lot of people hadn't bothered being vaccinated. And uh, I don't have the data to show you here, but in those places like Bavaria and Hessen, where uh, compulsory vaccination had been going a long time, uh, are much better placed, uh, and indeed England is much better placed than um, those parts that haven't uh, had that tradition of vaccination. And here we see the paraphernalia, uh, I suppose, of vaccination. Here's a, a vaccination certificate. They've been, uh, they, they started fairly early in the 19th century in many places. Um, not more for the convenience in some ways of someone vaccinated to, to have a record that they've been vaccinated. Um, and they, in some cases, they could get the money back or, 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 or get, a, get, get um, compensation if they caught smallpox. So the, the, the certificate initially worked for the, the person being vaccinated. And of course, again, was quite an important pass, passport for jobs and to get into the right schools and so on and so forth. And then we see the um, uh, new law for the empire, for the German empire in 1874, uh, which makes uh, by this time, German, Germany is being, uh, there's a re reunification of Germany, of course, and now we see overarching uh, laws to uh, standardise to some degree, and certainly uh, what we see is that uh, 
many places now have compulsory vaccination. There was a very strong anti-vaccination movement. I mean, it began uh, very early, um, as we've seen, particularly doubts about cowpox. Uh, but in that anti-vaccination movement, which really developed in strength against compulsory vaccination, we see some very strong threads, uh, some that we can see now, of course, in anti-vaccination, the rights of individual self-determination against the hubris of official opinion and its allopathic medical allies, and often indeed against expertise of any sort. That's from Baldwin's book written quite a, quite a long time ago before the present uh, debates about expertise. And a major rally in Leicester, uh, Centre of Active Vaccination, an effigy of Dr Jenner on the gallows. And of course, all the doubts about the virus and what it was doing to the body and, and so on and so forth uh, indicated there. The last section I'll be brief here is uh, really the prospect of the eradication. Um, and in some ways, vaccination was in a it was being pretty battered in the late 19th century, though uh, holding its own in, in some places, uh, not so much in others. What we see, of course, is uh, important developments that make vaccination, I suppose, more fit for purpose, um, to use that expression. Uh, the need for revaccination re was being recognised now, and the concerns about cross-infection, concerns about cross-infection here through that arm-to-arm -arm process because there were a few very well-publicised cases in the 1870s of people who'd been vaccinated, for, uh, vaccinated with cowpox that has come, had come from a child who actually had syphilis, and syphilis was being communicated in that process. Uh, and of course, these are children who uh, wouldn't have had symptoms of syphilis, uh, they'd probably been born with it, and. Uh, uh, this was a bit of a nightmare, really. Um, I mean, there weren't that many cases, but uh, there were a cluster, several clusters of, of cases in the, uh, in, the, in the 1870s. And what they did was to go back to the cow, which again seems counterintuitive in a way. Um, they, they had to uh, use vaccine to vaccinate calves. Um, by very deep incisions, it's, it's, it, they, they developed it over time. And then they used calf lymph uh, for the vaccine. And uh, generally, in, in big centres, of course, they'd have use a calf a day. Um, and this seems to have been a lot more acceptable to people. And, uh, of course, it was a bit more expensive as well. So it's, uh, uh, it was a, a bit of a problem. I mean, it's something that the elite got onto and then it needed to be made more generally available and so on. We've got the microbial revolution, of course, which begins to see microbes and understand a lot better what's, uh, what the agents of disease might be, although viruses were still uh, could not be seen. Glycerin was used to stabilize and sanitize lymph uh, to uh, keep it in, in good, good order, keep it liquid, and at the same time uh, uh, helped it to, to retain its power longer and also cleared up some of the bacterial um, residue, particularly that arose from uh, using calf lymph. And then in, in 1898, the, uh, an act of parliament in Britain allowed conscientious objection to vaccination. So we, we tried to retain the compulsion of vaccination, but allowed conscientious objection. And it might interest you that this, is, this term is first used here not in relation to military service. So conscientious objection as a principle comes through vaccination and then of course becomes uh, used in relation to uh, military conscription in the First World War. And then developments in refrigeration and particularly freeze drying allow people, allow governments and institutes to build up stockpiles of uh, vaccine. Well, the prospect of eradication, of course, uh, starts uh, becoming uh, evident in the, uh, in the early 19th century when Europe and North America really aren't having any smallpox around except where occasionally it was imported. 
<clears throat> and uh, we see the initiative of the World Health Organization uh, committing itself to the eradication of smallpox. And uh, in the circumstances, I think I'd like to mention Viktor Zhadanov, um, who is uh, Ukrainian from Donetsk, uh, graduate of Kharkiv Medical Institute, a prominent virolo virologist and the Deputy Minister of Health for uh, Khrushchev. And he played a crucial role in persuading the WHO, quote, that the world could eradicate smallpox within a decade with a united effort and successfully lobbied the USSR to donate 25 million doses of the smallpox vaccine to kickstart the effort in developing countries. And that is a quotation from the citation of the Future of Life Award that was granted to him uh, posthumously. D.A. Henderson headed up the eradication uh, campaign. Um, it, this shows, if you like, where uh, smallpox was still present. There's a massive discrepancy between the totals, e even in the same website, of course, that the World Health Organization had available to them and what Henderson claims, uh, because of course, um, what was registered, what the statistics that came into the WHO were very uh, limited and sh uh, flaky. Um, there were no statistics at all for all areas of the globe, I mean, including China, for example, and um, most of them were under-reporting, not giving information, you know, not, not, not having the data available to them anyway, the areas of government. But Henderson, claims that there were probably 10 million cases and 2 million deaths annually uh, when the campaign started. And this is, this is often quoted and extrapolated from, I mean, this seems to me a major overestimate, but I don't know who can really get hold of any better estimate. So you can see the enormous difference between uh, the half a million, uh, sorry, a quarter of a million cases in the early 60s on registered there and that estimate of 10 million cases. Well, the prospect of eradication, and I mentioned that right in the middle of this, we get this breakout of uh, uh, smallpox in um, the former Yugoslavia, starting in Kosovo, starting with uh, a, a pilgrim coming, returning from the Hajj, from Mecca, and had been through uh, Syria. And he'd been on a bus tour with some other people and came back. Uh, he had he had been he had been vaccinated. He didn't have any obvious symptoms. Um, he didn't have clear symptoms. He was he became seriously ill, but he wasn't diagnosed as smallpox. Um, and uh, uh, pro probably no, through no one's error in the sense that he had a very unusual form of deadly uh, smallpox. And it was totally atypical, and uh, it didn't, he, he didn't have the characteristic uh, symptoms at all. But it, it had already spread before people uh, really uh, realised. In the end, uh, uh, we see 175 cases and 35 fatalities. That's 20% uh, case mortality rate. What is interesting here, of course, is to see that uh, 105 of, the, of them were vaccinated only eight of whom died, that is 7.6% of the people who were vaccinated died, uh, whereas we see that 38.5% of the unvaccinated died. And uh, Yugoslavia at this time was, was fairly well vaccinated, though probably most people hadn't had their boosters, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, uh, that needs to be taken into account. But there was a massive uh, public health effort, effort with lockdowns, border closures, 10,000 suspected contacts quarantined for two weeks in hotels and apartment blocks. Sounds familiar. Uh, we see 1.2 million people in the Belgrade area and 18 million people in the former Yugoslavia vaccinated or revaccinated within three weeks. So a remarkable effort. And then we see something that again uh, touches our lives, uh, football in the lockdown. Um, a friendly match was played to an empty stadium, but the match was televised to raise spirits. The end of the epidemic in May enabled a full house to watch the derby between Red Star and Partizan Belgrade. And this is to credit of a, uh, 
a Croatian school history teacher. Well, I ask here, who won Ask Your Dad? And uh, I'd appreciate anyone uh, asking uh, their fathers or people, uh, family members, what they remember from that time. And I'd be very interested in any, any comments any of you have on that. And then, of course, we see, uh, finally, uh, Jenna's dream realized, uh, smallpox is dead. Um, Thomas Jefferson, the American president, has written 1806 to Jeff, Jeff, Jenna. Yours is the comfortable reflection that mankind can never forget that you lived. Uh, for future one will know only by history the loathsome smallpox existed and by you has been extirpated. Well, that was a little bit uh, premature, um, but of course we can see how uh, important it is for us to remember as historians what happened in the past and uh, how we long to see uh, a magazine with uh, COVID is dead uh, on the front cover. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Bennett. I think this was a very interesting lecture. I hope there will be some questions or comments from the audience. Allow me to uh, transmit Professor Avramovich's apology that he had to leave before the lecture ended due to some other obligations. He is our ambassador in the Vatican, so and he says the weekends are particularly busy, so he really mm -hmm. had to go. Uh, and thank you in my name for mentioning my article and I, I'm glad you liked it and found anything useful in it. Uh, I would just like to make one remark and ask one question. The remark is more for the benefit of any potential international audience that might be listening to the recording of this lecture afterwards, simply because you said that uh, in the context of the 72 epidemic in Yugoslavia, you said in a few uh, instances Kosovo and Serbia, though the map that you used does correctly depict Kosovo as a province of Serbia. So just to clarify, Kosovo was and legally still is an autonomous province of the Republic of Serbia. It was never a separate entity inside Yugoslavia and is still not, and we hope it will not be uh, internationally fully recognized as a separate entity since the secession was contrary to the principles of international law. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, uh, more to the point of of the lecture, the, the whole impression that I get from the story about the uh, discovery of the vaccine and the spread of vaccination, and of course the parallels that we're all probably making in our heads with the COVID situation right now, uh, is how we see uh, some um, on the other, on one hand, the one hand, very positive efforts of countries to eradicate a potentially deadly disease. Perhaps you could stop the sharing so we could see you properly. I'm, I'm just wondering how to do it. <laughs> just, just move the mouse to the to the top of the screen, uh, the top middle, and you'll have the stop sharing. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, uh, and we see countries trying very different methods somewhere, strict compulsory regimes of vaccination, somewhere um, more of an appeal to the population on how useful vaccination is. Um, but we also see different, as you said, anti-vaccination movements uh, from the ones that uh, we could consider uh, having some rational basis on uh, how risky the procedure is. We still have such qualms about the COVID vaccines today. It's a new thing. Is it foolproof? Has it been sufficiently tested? And so on to the ones that uh, seem completely irrational to us today, like the, the prospect of the vaccine turning uh, someone to cows and so on. Uh, 
And I remember uh, a passage that I found really interesting in, in your book, uh, a piece of information that I didn't know before, uh, considering Jenner's um, uh, biological research and the fact that Jenner had written a paper about the uh, behavior of the cuckoo bird uh, that plants its egg into other birds' eggs, which by now we consider a staple and uh, a very normal common knowledge thing, but was actually ridiculed at the time and that was used as an argument against vaccination because look, it's propagated by the person who wrote this silly thing. So I, I was just curious, I know it's not uh, perfectly uh, argumented and easy thing to make parallels between then and now, but do you who have been researching this subject much, much more see any more interesting parallels that you would like to point out between the situation with the vaccination and what we're facing today with COVID? Uh, I think you're muted. We can't hear you. Okay. Yes, we can hear you now. <laughs> yes, yeah, so just to take up um, your, your interesting comments at the outset, I suppose, the when we look at something like the Sellers Populi and, and we're looking at something where we're making some impositions uh, uh, where, where we're sort of overriding uh, ordinary laws and practices and we need to justify that by some sense of of necessity, uh, urgent, compelling necessity, and what we what we're looking at, of course, is something that is very, very complex because we are looking at very different conditions and moving targets and so on. And this is what I, what I became very aware of that. Uh, because a lot of people's doubts about vaccination then as now might be reasonable doubts. Um, there's also doubts about whether something is necessary at a particular time and so on and so forth. And uh, this sort of makes it a matter always of context. And this is this is sort of where looking at history, I think, is quite interesting because from the point of view of people, for example, who uh, didn't want to be vaccinated, didn't see the point of vaccination. Um, I mean, even apart from the people who've got religious objections and have worries about side, side effects and so on and so forth, um, there's also perceptions of, well, uh, I don't really think smallpox is around at the moment, so don't hassle me about it. And, you know, if, if in two or three years smallpox comes back, we'll get vaccinated then and so on. So people are making these sorts of judgments and they're ones that... Um, are, make it very unclear when in fact, you know, that sounds popular, the idea of overwriting, uh, overruling laws and customs sort of applies. Um, and uh, the, the, the history, I think, throws up all sorts of contexts and you can look at those and, 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 and find, uh, you know, think about what, what decisions should have been taken or what were the right, you know, what, what were the valid um, imposts made on people and um, what do you do then about the present? You, you keep on making these sort of rules, or do you just accept there's some sort of idea that you've got to you've got to go with what the government has decided? You you, you shouldn't be making too much of a noise about it, and so on. Um, and um, this is one of the things that made me a little bit interested in what happened in 1972 in um, uh, in. in Belgrade and so on, and, and certainly uh, I'd be very interested in anyone who uh, asked their parents what they thought about um, uh, what they they were forced to do in, in 1972, whether they accepted the, the emergency or felt that it was an imposition and so on. I'd be quite interested because it's, it's something that is, is, is well worth thinking about, and um, uh, I, I, I guess some people at least have been thinking about these things um, in Serbia. Um, so uh, I, I, I'd, I'd like to sort of hear a bit of oral history actually in terms of uh, uh, what happened there. 
because it's it's you know very similar to what you know what has been happen, happening in the past except uh, uh, by 1972 there's certainly a, a lot more ability to there's a lot more ability to intervene I mean a particularly authoritarian I suppose um, regime generally um, uh, but now of course we've we're also moving into a different situation where um, we 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 we've putting controls that were un unthinkable in earlier times. So the, the very fact that we have the electronic communications now has made certain sorts of things feasible that wouldn't have been feasible, weren't feasible in 1972, wouldn't be feasible even 10, 15 years ago. Uh, the whole economy would have come crashing down in Australia if it hadn't been for uh, modern technology. So um, yeah. we, we, we've, we have got that um, uh, sense in which um, uh, historical situations sort of differ and um, it's hard to see patterns and one of the points about vaccination in the 19th century that Peter Baldwin tried to do of course was to sort of see whether there's any difference between what he saw as liberal states and authoritarian states and in the end he, he found that uh, so-called authoritarian states and so-called liberal states um worked in similar sorts of ways but i mean sometimes on different uh trajectories and different times according to the situation according to the level of the threat and and, and so on um that there wasn't any predisposition to um intervene authorit authoritatively in some countries that you might imagine uh, perhaps like prussia where uh, the government's had a great deal more power um, uh, as in places like England and eventually uh, in France, uh, where there were stronger liberal traditions, um, didn't seem to make too much difference in terms of the, uh, the policies uh, enacted. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions? Simo Ilitsch has a question. Simo, go ahead. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, first, I must say that uh, I enjoyed a great lecture, and uh, I think I learned a lot. Uh, so thank you, Professor. And I have a question about uh, the logistics cost of this. Uh, uh, was it expensive to do vaccination all around the world? And uh, you know, the, were there some logistical barriers that that uh, slowed process in general? Uh, are you talking about my research here? You, you're talking about my research for the book, is that? Um, the uh, I I um, I got, I got a, a lot of information from general reading over the years. I mean, I came to the project because I was teaching the 18th century and suddenly found this sort of interesting material, people talking about vaccination and um, uh, some unusual sources. I mean, for example, vaccination registers, you know, haven't been used by people really. And, and yet you've got the interesting breakdown of people being vaccinated and interesting problems that, that were thrown up where, um, I, I was particularly interested in the roles of fathers and mothers uh, in, in, in making decisions about vaccination and uh, uh, you know you, you, you get all sorts of insights. So I began that research and um, I was able to collect an awful lot of material and then I was able to get a research grant to uh, do some of the archival work and in particular they encouraged to uh, um, some uh, scholarships for PhD students, and I had two PhD students, one who worked on smallpox inoculation in Spain and one who worked in smallpox inoculation in Germany, and they uh, did some research for me. I paid for them to to do research. And then I used um, some some people with uh, uh, languages that I didn't, I didn't have, a large number of languages I didn't have, uh, Swedish and Dutch and so on, that um, and got them to make some notes on books, and then I would interrogate them further, get more and more detail and information. So yes, collecting, in, in, you know, trying to do a, a sort of decent job of uh, the global 
um, situation. Um, obviously, it involved an awful, awful lot of uh, uh, work and uh, work in different languages. And I found I, I was, you know, very excited to find, in some ways, quite different sorts of interest in in, diff in the experience of vaccination in different different countries. Thank you, Professor. And I would like to use the opportunity to really recommend Professor Bennett's book to everyone who is interested in the subject. Isidora has a question. Uh, yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. First of all, good evening to you. I know it's really late in Australia right now to be holding a lecture and everything. Uh, considering that you are really well versed in the smallpox epidemic and that we are all living through an epidemic right now. I wanted to hear your opinion about uh, the repetition of the same pattern of behavior, the people's apprehension about vaccines. How do you see uh, today's apprehension where science is much more advanced and the apprehension that was uh, in the centuries before? It's surprisingly similar. I mean, in, in part, it is because there is uh, quite a, a strong anti-vaccination tradition, and I'm uh, very surprised how sort of anti-vaccination tracts, uh, treatises, and so on that were written in the 19th century are still used by people, um, and uh, there's there's there's. I, I was in my research. I found it very problematic to be dealing with um, some of the anti-vaccination material for the, from the nineteenth century because um, the you know there's a lot of fake news. Then um, there was also sometimes a kernel of truth in the fake news. Um, quite a lot of um, people spent a lot of time trying to. Uh, address those sort of issues so people would be claiming that you know that this child has uh, I mean in some cases they're saying this child had developed a deformity and uh, it's a picture a picture of a, a grotesque child who'd been vaccinated and this sort of thing and so they would send someone around from the vaccination institute to get the true story and try and put it right but you you, you get the whole thing um, solid by uh, this sort of uh, commentary um, and what is one of the things that's quite interesting is that in England, um, Jenna and his uh, friends in vaccination were um, getting quite hot under the collar because of the freedom of the press in England. And um, he pointed to France where Napoleon, Napoleon was a great champion of vaccination. And Napoleon, of course, didn't allow the French newspapers to circulate reports of uh, adverse cases of vaccination. So you, you see right in the early 19th century, um, the issue, if you like, of the freedom of the press and uh, uh, what happens when the press is, people use it, the, the media irresponsibly and, and so on. So to that degree, it's, it's not surprising to see uh, all that re-emerge. And of course, it's particularly not surprising given the um, you know, what has happened in the USA and uh, under Trump, I suppose, in terms of the, um, you, know, you know, the idea that, that, there are two, that there are two sets of reality or there's no truth or whatever. Um, and, uh, yeah, in terms of so the science, I mean, you, you, you have got um, a lot of uh, well-educated people, indeed, of course, people in the medical profession who... Um, are suspicious about the vaccine um, uh, for a variety of reasons. And again, you can sort of see why in some cases they think that maybe, you know, these vaccines uh, um, are, are no good or, you know, I'm better off without them if I can, and maybe, maybe you know, COVID isn't that bad and so on. So you, you, can, you can see how it's fueled by some sort of reasonable suspicions that people might have um, and you know a lot of people do like their own opinions and 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 so on and and to some degree um, I, I mean I don't know 
about you, but I'm sure that most people have felt at various times the government is doing the wrong thing, the government is giving the wrong advice, you know, it's getting silly and so on and so forth. Um, but you, you, you know, there's a point at which you say, well, I just have to go along with this, really. It's uh, sort of, um, uh, you, you, you know, to, to some extent, it, community cohesion is very important in terms of crisis and uh, uh, do, do you want to inflame that or not? And uh, um, yes, it's, uh, as, as, as you say, it's, uh, it's there and um, uh, we wonder about it and uh, we want certainly freedom of speech and um, you know it's it's troubling to hear of of suppression of course suppression of then feeds people's sense of conspiracy and so on mm. do you have Thank any answers <laughs> do you have any feelings about this uh me yeah um well i don't know i i see where people are apprehensive about government's decisions because i've spent most of my life in montenegro where we know what kind of government has been ruling for a long time but i won't get into that but still i think that a lot of young people don't even consider the choices we have we have so many papers researchers scientists say something about the vaccines we all know that it's not going to be a hundred percent safe nothing in this life is a hundred percent guaranteed so i think that it's really ludicrous to think to even uh, get back to those opinions that were there in 1800s and something like that i cannot i can't comprehend how somebody would uh, see a paper from even one a hundred years ago and be like oh that's a viable reason for my opinion because a lot of things have changed since mm -hmm. a year ago since 10 10 years ago so i think that we should really <laughs> focus on what's happening today what is the best for our safety and things that are going to impact us for the better Okay, any more questions, comments? If not, then let us thank Professor Bennett once again for the lecture. Here's also a, a chat of thanks from Vidosava. So it was very interesting. Thank you very much for being our guest and for managing to accommodate the time all the way from Australia and we hope that you will be a guest of our faculty and of the forum perhaps sometime in the future again in person when the pandemic subsides. Best wishes to your work and all your studies and uh, research students and so on. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs> Bye, good night. <laughs> and for everyone else, we're continuing next week in the regular Friday night time. Okay. Think about you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye.